thank you everybody for uh, joining this webinar today. Our panel is on uh, being a uh, sort of EMS, being a paramedic or an EMT. And I'm very excited to have the, the four panels that we do. Uh, first, we have James, uh, who is a paramedic and firefighter with the Evergreen Fire Department, as well as an instructor here at Flathead Valley Community College for the paramedic and EMT programs. Uh, Kylie is a coworker of his at Evergreen Fire Department, also a paramedic and a firefighter. And then we have Bethany and Jameson, who are also, they're both students at FECC in the paramedic program and current EMTs. And so we'll talk a little bit about both sort of the EMT and, and then the paramedic and the differences between the two and how they connect and then kind of go into some other questions. But uh, just to get us started, if uh, Bethany, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Just tell us just a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got to become a paramedic student and, and get into the EMS world. Uh, yeah, so I have uh, been an EMT on a rural service for about three years. I started with some wilderness medicine training, um, just certificates outside of licensure, and that really um, helped me pursue the critical thinking and helping people in their panic zone and like a wilderness guiding kind of context, um, and then pursued local EMT certification in my small community, and then it's just kind of piqued my interest there. I had some life changes and now I'm pursuing paramedicine, just the next step of medical training that way. So yeah, I've been working um, on two volunteer rural services for um, one of them for about three years, one of them for about six months um, and loving just being an influence in my community. Um, and I want to better myself to help better those around me. Wonderful. And I also want to thank you all for everything you're doing with, uh, you know, healthcare and taking care of the community, especially given everything that's gone on with the pandemic. I, somebody who has zero interest in being in healthcare myself, I am very appreciative of those who go into it and take care of me. So thank you so much. Um, let's go, with, uh, Jameson. How about you? What what brought you into this world? Did you hear me, Jameson? I did not hear you, oh. sorry. Yeah, what brought you into, you know, getting you into the EMS world? Oh, I have a um, contract firefighting company. And so I thought it would be a natural progression to go into, uh, get at least my EMT license. And when I went through EMT school, I just became addicted to it. I started volunteering with Whitefish Fire Department and I just want to progress and get as much knowledge as I can. Great. How about you, Kylie? Well, uh, my whole career kind of started as a resident assistant when I was going to Portland State University. Um, and when you're an RA, um, you're like the dorm mom, as some people like to call it, but you uh, also respond to emergencies in the building. Um, and I really enjoyed that part of the job. So uh, once I graduated, I went to EMT school, um, and then short after that, I worked in Salem, Oregon for a private am ambulance company. Um, we had about 30,000 calls a year, so pretty busy. Um, we stayed busy with lots of interesting things over there, and then uh, I decided I wanted to go and do some more rural-type medicine, so that's kind of what brought me here, um, and then snowboarding, of course, but I ended up in the paramedic program at FECC. And uh, then I am now working at Evergreen um, as a firefighter paramedic, like you said. Wonderful. And James, what was your story? Yeah, so I started out on the East Coast um, in the investment banking world, very different than what I'm doing now. Kind of moved out here. Um, I was raised out here, but moved back East to work and uh, took my uh, life back West to find, uh, like Kylie as well, some snowboarding and outdoor activities and found myself as a guide um, whitewater and fly fishing uh, in the summer and fall and kind of teaching uh, skiing and snowboarding in the winter and I came across a lot of accidents um, had no medical experience no medical knowledge and no way to help um, uh, so I took an EMT class which uh, just kind of snowballed into uh, becoming a paramedic uh, taking a fire academy becoming a firefighter and paramedic and um, it definitely changed my life I love serving the community I love what I do it's very exciting and uh, Definitely different than sitting behind a desk and crunching numbers. So, and that's, uh, yeah, it's kind of how I got to be uh, where I am. I applied for the college a few years ago and started teaching with the EMT classes. 
uh, and now I teach the paramedics as well and work as a, in a full-time capacity there as well. All right. Very glad to have you here. So I'm just gonna throw this one out to any of you. So if, you know, feel free to whoever wants to take it and, and run with it. Um, but is there a single moment that has been like either the craziest, most mind blowing moment of your career as an EMT or a paramedic? I've got a couple. Uh, so when I was started with planes, the ambulance, we didn't have any paramedics. Um, currently we have one paramedic in our entire county and he's probably been there for about a year. And so we run like ALS calls BLS, like all the time, getting them to the closest facility. And then they usually sometimes ALS transport them. So advanced life support, transport them to another bigger hospital. So, um, and because we're volunteer, we don't always have every shift like staffed all the time. So, you know, you hear the pager go off and then whoever's available kind of responds. Um, so we get called out to a motor vehicle accident with a potential uh, ejection from the vehicle from both participants in the vehicle. And so I, you know, head out there with my driver who took an EMT class, but was not licensed. Um, so I ended up being the only license on scene for about 10 minutes with like two people who had been thrown from the vehicle. Um, and it was really cool to see everything run like really smoothly. Like I was confident in what I was doing. I had a ton of help from the firefighters who showed up who actually work really well with our EMS uh, system. Um, so they gave me a good like on scene report and I'm like assessing this one and giving direction and assessing that one and giving direction and coming back and forth and kind of triaging and managing the scene until another ambulance showed up with two more EMTs. Um, and then we kind of loaded everybody and went. And luckily like the worst injury was like a clavicle um, fracture, but uh, it was one of those nerve wracking, like I'm, I'm it, like this is me and these people like need my help. And then for it to just run really smoothly after the fact um, and just the way that the communication and training kind of just paid off. Um, it, it was moments like those where um, like it's worth it, you know, when you're able to be present in somebody's worst moment there and be able to like help them and see that through has been kind of really encouraging me to continue to move forward to be able to give better care. So it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I have one when, uh, when I was going through my paramedic training in my clinical rotations, I was on with uh, Whitefish Fire and you know, some days it's quiet, uh, just depends on the kind of, you know, vibe that's going on that day. And this particular day, we got paged out for a pedestrian that was struck by a vehicle. Um, and he ended up thrown over a, a guardrail and impaled on a tree. And uh, we got on scene and there was this gentleman literally hanging from a tree like a scarecrow, you know, 20 feet up um, with a baseball bat size chunk of wood sticking through his back. And everybody was, you know, it's not something you see every day. It's, it's, mildly terrifying kind of what Bethany's hinting at you know we were able to collectively be calm um, remove this gentleman from the tree uh, with the drugs that we were carrying on the ambulance we were able to completely put him to sleep and take away his pain um, three days later that gentleman walked out of the hospital um, amazingly uh, he survived and was able to fly home uh, one of those good life-saving moments that you know we kind of train for and we don't get to perform every day so that was that was one of my most shocking or best you know, best moments and it was all during my that was during my training like i say so uh pretty cool to see that uh in in real world play out that's when you know if you stick with that you're you're in the right career that's right, that's right. <laughs> Any, anyone else oh um, i have one um <laughs> so this one was in salem morgan um and uh, can have some interesting things happen there. I just, it's a city. Um, and so we got called to a shooting or a GSW gunshot wound. Um, and we ended up packaging the patient and putting him in the ambulance. He still had a pulse um, and was breathing. Um, but while we were loading the patient into the ambulance, I'm standing looking out back of the ambulance and uh, and all my coworkers have their back to what's going on behind them and they're kind of facing me. And all of a sudden I see this truck pull up and there was probably like 20 cops on scene and they all rush in and pull their guns. <laughs> and like, it was just this surreal moment. Um, and I know that's not necessarily like 
uh, medical, but just like knowing that anything can happen on these scenes and you just really need to maintain that situational awareness. Um, and so I was able to kind of calmly let my crew know, hey, like, let's get this patient in this ambulance and let's step inside um, so that we're at least uh, protected a little bit. So just one of those moments that you see on TV and it kind of does happen sometimes, <laughs> so. All right, well, let's move on. Um, in terms of, does somebody want to sort of take us, explain a little bit, you know, what the difference is between the EMT, the paramedic, and then maybe someone else kind of walk us through in the ambulance, what does that team look like that's responding to an emergency? You know, you have an ambulance driver, is that an EMT or paramedic? You know, what, what, what sort of does that team look like? So maybe James, do you want to go with sort of talking about the EMT and versus the paramedic and? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of that just depends kind of on the needs of the community. Um, you know, if it's a rural area where there have no paramedics um, and a limited number of EMTs, you may have somebody that's assigned strictly as an ambulance driver only. Uh, for example, local, relatively locally, that happens in Browning, um, where there's no medical training, but we have a driver. Um, and then EMT is kind of the basic entry level. You know, uh, people can get that done in a semester and earn an EMT, EMT certificate. Um, and what that allows them to do is basically stabilize and transport the patient in a safe manner. Um, and by stabilizing, it just means, you know, if there's any broken bones or, you know, anything like that, which isn't always the case, they can splint them, they can help them. Um, Moving up into the paramedic world, though, it's a it's a it's another game. Um, we're often compared to you know field nurses or field physicians because we have a lot of drugs in our arsenal that we can use. Um, our big bread and butter is is cardiology, uh, you know, studying the heart and then medications. There's about 90 medications, a little more than 90 medications that we can administer depending on the situation and our local protocols. Um, so often we team up. Uh, it's really great to have uh, an EMT on scene who is you know, to be honest, just more of a, a basic th thinker, they can help um, kind of navigate the scene where the paramedic is trying to figure out what, what they're going to do, what cocktail, what concoction, how to, how to help in that situation. So you have this more advanced scientific thinking uh, going on with the paramedic uh, where the EMT can kind of just say, hey, did we remember to make sure they're, they're breathing? Do we remember the, 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 the basic things, which is why they're referred to as basic life support uh, and a paramedic is referred to as an advanced life support provider. So, um, and then just a lot of times, especially locally, our firefighters are trained in medicine as well. So they're either an EMT or paramedic. Um, the national trend is kind of shifting that firefighters would be a paramedic. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a firefighter uh, to be an EMT or a paramedic for sure. Uh, but it's just one of those things we do deal, you know, uh, with each other, we're the same team. Uh, like Kylie was kind of hinting at as well there that the, you know, we deal with the police departments. Um, they keep us safe. Uh, you know, we don't carry any personal protection or anything along those lines. So if a scene happens to be unsafe for any reason, um, whether that's, you know, vehicles driving around, if we're at a, a motor vehicle crash or, uh, you know, if we're at a domestic violence call, uh, we need to make sure that everybody involved is safe. The, uh, our partner, the community, the patients, et cetera. So, Generally, we uh, you'll you'll find that a paramedic and an EMT run in an ambulance together, and it brings up a good point, Luke. Something I uh, you know like to point out that everybody thinks of EMTs and paramedics as riding in the back of ambulances, which is definitely the the primary job that you'll find them doing. Uh, but there are people that travel the world. They end up on oil tankers. They end up in combat fields. They end up in mission services, uh, volunteering for you know. Um, more deprived third world countries, things like that. Uh, so you, you can certainly travel the world. Uh, there are people in um, golf country clubs that might be a paramedic in case somebody, you know, has a, a heart attack or something. Um, cruise ships, ocean liners, um, most of these are required to have some type of medical service. So if you're really lucky, you might end up, uh, you know, traveling around the Bahamas and catching a, a wicked tan and, um, you know, providing medicine for people on board a, a ship and you know, that's, there's a lot of different things that can be done with this field. It's not just sitting in the back of an ambulance and going on terrible car crashes and things like that. So it's, uh, I do like to point that out that, um, 
You know, we always think of just that lights and sirens, pull over the vehicle, you know, everybody, oh, there's an EMT, there's paramedics on their way there. But um, it definitely has a lot of opportunity to work in, in other spaces, say if uh, you broaden your horizons. And... Does anybody have anything they want to add to that? Very well said. All right, perfect. Um, so Jameson, let me ask you this, as, as a student, a paramedic student, uh, what do you think is a trait or a skill that you know, helps you be successful going through the program? Oh, having your uh, study skills honed <laughs> is definitely, <laughs> definitely helpful. Um, but I would say being able to think clearly when uh, it's stressful. Um, and then humility, being able to take criticism is extremely important. How about you, Bethany? Uh, yeah, character qualities. I love that Jameson said like humility because there's a lot of learning process. Um, and uh, one of my favorite like quotes about learning is like, you cannot have learning without loss. Um, and some of that loss can include like pride and like what I had previously thought was the right thing to do and being willing to change with being willing to grow with that. Um, and so, yeah, the humility I think is great. I think knowing kind of what you want to do with it, like being serious about it is really good. Like if you're just coming in passively, like this is kind of cool. Um, you're not gonna get the most out of it. Like you're gonna get out of it what you put into it. And if you're going towards that direction and just starting with your EMT classes, having that forward thinking is gonna help you do better, I guess, in that in that direction. But yeah, the critical thinking skills and thinking outside the box and just understanding body systems um, and, and being able to find it, fix it fast, you know, that's kind of what we do, so. Cool. And just quick note for uh, the high school students that are attending this panel. Again, if you have questions, um, you can submit them in that Q&A uh, box feature on the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then at the end, if we have time, we can go through those and, and ask um, in our panelists those questions. So feel free to submit those as they come up. Um, one of the questions we, we ask in these panels is sort of like, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what is an average day like on the job, but given sort of the nature of this, right? I feel like, <laughs> what is average? So rather than maybe talking about that as much, what what have you found either as an EMT or a paramedic are, are some of the bigger challenges or hurdles for either being successful on the job or in, enjoying the job? Because I got to imagine there's moments where the tragedies you deal with, you know, will have some degree of an impact on you. Um, but what are other things that might, you, you know, you find challenging with this career? And go ahead and whoever wants to take that first. Oh, that's a good question. Um, there, <laughs> you definitely need to have your your uh, ways of stress management kind of figured out. Um, I think everybody deals with the job differently. Um, I think one thing that everybody has in common is what's called gallows humor. Um, and it's honestly dark humor. Um, and, I, you know, as horrible as that sounds, I think it's one thing that does kind of keep you sane. Um, and there's a real word for it. It's called gallows humor. Um, and I think um, that's one thing we all have in common is humor. Uh, but I think everybody's different in how they process through what they see. Um, obviously, like if you go to some big incident, there's uh, what's called a AAR typically afterwards and action after action review. Um, and that's where you all sit together as a team and you talk about what happened and um, you know, what, what went well, what could have changed, what was difficult, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I think everybody, like I enjoy exercise. So if I have a, a bad call or whatever, I'll just go run. Um, we're lucky we have a gym at our fire department. So um, can utilize that. But uh, some people, I mean, a lot of people have counselors and therapists that they talk to. Um, and I mean, like, I don't know, whatever you enjoy to do, you know, I think everybody here could probably tell you what they do to kind of get through those types of things. But um, like I said, mine's exercise. Um, 
So yeah, it's not always an easy job, but I think you kind of have to look at uh, the calls that did go well and, and maybe even that call that you just held someone's hand, um, you changed their day. And some of those calls are actually the ones that I remember way more than one of the gnarly calls that people like to hear about, so. Yeah, I'll go back to your first question on that, Luke, whether we were asking about the craziest call. Um, and let's be honest, there, it's not every day that we, you know, are pulling people out of mangled car crashes or uh, cutting people out of a tree, uh, anything like that. That's very uncommon. And a lot of our calls end up very positive. Um, you know, it's somebody that's just having a bad day. They fell and sprained or broke a leg or, you know, they were skiing and dislocated a shoulder, very simplistic kinds of things. And you know, one of the th tools that I use and I encourage my students to use is by building on those positive calls, all these ones that we were able to help, that we did wonderful work, where things went well, um, even when one or two things might not have, we have this memory bank built up of all the positive experiences and the, the positive patient outcomes. And it definitely helps to, uh, to deal with some of those harder calls. Um, like Kylie was pointing out, we all have our, our stress relieving things, you know, people go snowboarding or they go fishing or they go for a run. Um, and it's definitely important to build those uh, psychological barriers, if you will. Um, but like I said, a normal, a normal day could just be, you know, a lot of like this time of year, we deal with a lot of the flu. Um, it's just people that are hacking and coughing or, or they're, they're getting sick. So it's not all doom and gloom and, and blood and gore. Um, it's definitely a lot of, uh, you know, holding grandma's hand and just making her feel that she's safe on the way to the hospital to get checked out. And um, those are the ones that help you sleep really, really well at night, knowing that you've really helped the community um, and been a, a positive impact on someone's life. That was one of the biggest breakthroughs for me, being relatively new in this field was being able to show up on a call and you see the person having the emergency is panicked. They're afraid, they're really scared. You see it on their face. But when they see the EMTs or the paramedics coming, the instant relief that comes across on their expression and that makes it really worthwhile. To add to your like challenge question, I think it, like, I don't know, I would I totally agree with what everybody's saying on the like personnel aspect for sure. Some of the struggles that you might come up with are just kind of more like organizational related, um, finding a good service to get on, finding like your sweet spot of what you really enjoy doing, whether that's like sitting on an oil tanker, sitting like as a paramedic for like a TV show or like fire, wildland fires and stuff like that, or whether you want to stay in your small rural community or go to a bigger city, it's going to be very different dynamics in different contexts. And so being aware that the medicine doesn't change, but your context of like practicing that might change um, and finding something that works for you. Like rural EMS is very different than, you know, urban EMS. And um, so you're going to probably just really rely on your, your crew um, and learning about your organization and working together as a team. And that's huge. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, we're, have about six minutes left. So um, I have one more question and then we can turn to some of the questions from the high school students. Um, but either what was the best sort of career decision you ever made or what would you tell the students that are you know, participating today or what advice would you give sort of high school you knowing that you eventually you wanna become, you know, join the EMS world, um, whether that's, you know, classes to take, things to do, experiences to have, just, you know, what do you wish somebody maybe would have told you? Um, so something along those lines. If, and, and let's kind of maybe start with you on that. Yeah. Um, so I guess start with the, the one thing I wish I would have known before I got into the field is that not every day is going to be adrenaline pumping. Um, in fact, like very few of your calls are like that. Um, but you kind of learn to appreciate the job in a different way um, the more you do it. And I think no matter how many people tell you that it's not an adrenaline pumping job, you're still gonna believe it is, because <laughs> um, I did. And, uh, but like I said, you learn to appreciate the job in a different way. Um, and then 
I think just, you know, if you're in high school right now and, and you're interested in this career, like, honestly, like live your life through high school. I think life experience is one of the biggest factors that helps you in this career. Um, uh, and I know that sounds weird, but, um, you know, if, if you are gung ho about this, like go to EMT school. I mean, um, some places you don't have to be 18. Some places you do, some places you have to be 21, but, um, you know, just get started on your career as an EMT and volunteer, um, like Bethany's doing. And, uh, and then when you're ready, you just, and, you know, apply. And that's, that's the best way obviously to get in. Um, but like I said, life experience is going to help you a lot. Um, just, you know, working jobs, working customer service, working at the mall, selling things like, cause this job is basically just, um, in a way, customer service, <laughs> um, and, uh, just being able to talk to someone and like using your verbal judo is what police departments call it, where you can talk someone down, um, without getting physical because that's not what we do. Um, but just that communication aspect is super important and, um, just being kind of emotionally sound with yourself, um, is another super important thing. So it all comes from just experiencing life. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, let me throw this out there for you, James, just as we're running out of time. And there's been a handful of these questions now pop up uh, from the students. But what, um, you know, how do you get your license? What are the steps you need to take, you know, to become an EMTU paramedic? Sure. Um, so just kind of to feed on both of those questions, I definitely encourage people that are interested in the field to find a service or an agency they can volunteer with. Um, try and pick up a mentor, somebody that's working in any medical field, um, even veterinarianism, something that has to do with, with, uh, with medicine. Um, but the steps themselves are, you know, first to take a class. Um, the class is the prerequisite to gaining a license um, and certification. Uh, once you've taken the class, you have a base knowledge uh, to challenge the exam. The national exam uh, is a two-step process. One of them is just your cognitive skills, um, you know, all the, all the book information, everything in there. So there's a, you know, you sit for a, uh, I think it's a, a hundred question approximately, depends on how well you do or how poorly you do, but there's about a hundred question test um, that you sit and take that exam. And then the second part of that exam is a physical test or a psychomotor test where we actually review your skills that you've learned throughout the class um, and put them you know, into a scenario environment where we take a fake patient, if you will, a faux patient. It could be a mannequin or somebody pretending to be ill or injured. Um, and then we test the skills that we've trained you on throughout that process. So at the EMT, it's like I say, about a semester to, uh, to, to go through that class. And then at the end of that, you're ready to, to challenge that. And if you're interested then to pursue the paramedic, uh, it's the same type of test. It's a written test as well as a uh, hands-on demonstration of your skills. And that class goes for three semesters. So uh, you earn an associate's degree with the paramedic uh, certification. Uh, so depending on, you know, kind of what has been mentioned by the other panelists, the uh, EMT, it's your entry level. It gets you in the door if you're interested. Absolutely take a class uh, and see if it's something that you are really interested in. And then the reason I encourage people to volunteer at an agency is so that they can actually get their hands on these patients and see if it's something that they truly want to experience before they dive into the paramedic world. Uh, there are students uh, in every class every year that we have that uh, have spent no time on an ambulance. They took their EMT, they are committed to this, uh, and then they jump headfirst in as a paramedic student and no problems necessarily will arise from that. Um, but I definitely encourage you to, if you have the time and uh, you have the ability to get your EMT, get onto an agency, practice as an EMT first, and then uh, go through those motions to become a paramedic. And uh, all I can say is it's a super rewarding field. I have been through a lot of you know, career decisions in my life that uh, I, I wasn't really sure on. And, you know, being a guide and a, an instructor, I definitely impacted people in a different way. Uh, you know, you have people with you doing high fives on the, on the river, uh, your pictures on their wall. So that's a different memory. And then you have somebody that came in and, and took care of you at the worst moment of your life. And it just kind of, for me personally, that was a more rewarding opportunity. Um, I, I feel like that's a really cool thing. And going back to, you know, what, what helps us sleep at night and things like that, that that's definitely one of them. And, and with the EMT program specifically, 
is that eligible for the Running Start program? So if like a high school senior is interested, could they sign up for that via Running Start and then sort of take advantage of the benefits there? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we do have students through the Running Start program. Um, you do have to demonstrate a proficiency, like uh, it has been mentioned before. Even Montana, you do need to be 18 to obtain an EMT license, uh, unless you get an instructor's sign off um, that says that you're that you're competent and you've demonstrated a mature a maturity level that's appropriate for an EMT. Uh, so it is eligible for Running Start, and you can get that uh, certification and licensure prior to 18 uh, with the approval. Awesome. Good to know. Well, we are out of time. So I want to thank our panelists so much for taking the time to talk with us today and, and just let us know more about their careers and, and how they got there. And thank you for all the high school students out there who attended this. If you have any questions, please talk to your teachers. They can you know, connect you with me. Um, I can connect with James or some other people that you know would be interested in chatting with you and just yeah, pursue your career, figure out what you want to do and go for it. But again, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. And we all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.